We're here with composer Scott Walschlager, who has done amazing, amazing works. I mean, I love this uh, quote that characterizes you as, let me find it here, a mix between Martin Feldman meets Thelonious Monk meets H.P. Lovecraft. I love that description of your work. Mm -hmm. um, we're here to talk about this album, which I've actually got here. It's called Between Breath, which is a, a, one of the tracks on the CD. I wonder if you can talk about first about uh, the collaboration, all the people that are performing your music on this recording. Uh, yeah, so um, the uh, record has um, works that were written on and off uh, for about seven year period. Um, they're all commissioned compositions uh, by the performers that are featured on the album. So you're hearing sort of expert performances of the pieces by the people they were written for and uh, who have been playing these pieces for many years. Um, the pieces themselves don't have much in common with each other other than I wrote them all. And um, there's a lot of similarities, I think, between the string writing in my music um, and Oddly enough, I found, you know, Between Breath, the title track, um, uses trombone and, and piano. And the song that is on the album, Anyway, Where Threads Go, It All Goes Well, uh, uses uh, pitch pipes, which is a like a, basically it's a educational uh, instrument for kids to learn how to tune their instruments. But uh, the singer blows through it and making sort of like a tone cluster with it. And I found that oh, like the pitch pipe is kind of like a very, very bizarre wind instrument. And we could sort of, you know, have it be a very loose cousin of the trombone in some sort of demented uh, sonic world. Um, and I, it was important for me to have a song on the album because I feel um, it gives a human voice to the whole arc of the, of the album. And um, yeah, so each piece is written individually, you know, with the performers in mind, long collaborations, uh, like the piece for Miranda Cuxon, uh, Secret Machine 7. We we worked on that on and off for about two years. Of course, it was during COVID. So, you know, we had to sort of, you know, moderate how much we could meet up and it was sort of spread out. But um, and similar with Between Breath, the title track, you know, we had to do a lot of it through Zoom and all the other, you know, methods people had to do for collaboration. Um but yeah, and so it ends up being this compilation, but it it works as a kind of complete piece in and of itself, um, you know, with the string music being the beginning and the end. I, I almost see it as kind of opening a portal that the listener is invited into that at the end, you know, closes up and, uh, you know, ho hopefully has made it through the journey, you know, unscathed. Um, I'm I'm still stuck on the pitch pipe thing. I'm waiting for a pitch pipe concerto from you. But <laughs> <laughs> um, Secret Machine number seven. Now that is obviously number seven in a series of works of that title. Yes, it, yes, that's right. So Secret Machines are probably my, one of my oldest running series of serial or not serial, but pieces that are in a series. Um, and uh, Secret Machine. Six was completed in 2012, so it's been a while since I've written a so-called secret machine. Um, and the reason the secret machine series, uh, all, all the secret machines are basically what you would call a process piece. Um, loosely, I'm using the term loosely. Uh, you know, process music is usually uh, you know Steve Reich and American minimalists are usually affiliated with that term, but. Um, what what happens in the secret machine pieces is there's a, a process that's slowly revealing the music and in the uh, secret machine seven the process is the range of the violin is uh it, it revealed you know slowly through different pizzicato notes in the violin sort of activate a new zone of the violin. So by the beginning or by the end of the piece, you have the whole range of the violin being used and the there's a cyclic quality to the uh, the, the structure. And I think it it, uh, it's, it has the sense of being almost like a machine in a sense, but it's very organic. And so I think it is kind of in between organic and inorganic, you know, machine-like in the way something natural could almost be like a machine. And the secret part comes from my own convoluted process where I, I usually forget at some point in the composing process what my procedures are, or I just they, they become intuitive and I don't really look back. So the 
the secret is to me, I don't really know how I wrote the piece once it's done. So, uh, you know, it remains a secret for, for forever. And I've even tried to find old sketches of the other secret machines. Like, how did I write that? You know, like, what was I doing? And I still can't really decipher it. So, um, you know, my cryptic sketches don't reveal the secret either. So maybe some smart future scholar can figure it out. But um, yeah. Well, it's interesting because like your language with the solo violin in that piece it is it very much has a certain direction that it's going toward it, the, these little gestures from the violin that sound like they're meant to be, you know, and, but I hear that music and it sounds different than anything else that I hear for the solo instrument. Yes. Um, it, that is part of your, your secret process. <laughs> um, I, I like to think so. Um, you know, writing for the violin, solo violin, it, it's one of the hardest instruments, I think, to compose for. Um, there are so many bad pieces for solo violin. I it's I feel so sorry for violinists and audience people who have had to sit through literally centuries of just bad solo violin music. And um, my favorite solo violin composer is um, Paganini. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think why I like Paganini the most is that it's kind of active. There's a lot going on. It really it just it's just very fascinating to listen to and watch a Paganini piece. And so when I was setting out to write for violin, I, I was like, well, Paganini is my model. I don't want it to be some sort of cheesy, you know, whatever, 19th century, you know, not not nodding my head, my head to the past or whatever. So I have a violin that I abused in a loving way, uh, exploring different sounds and, um, you know, really want to come up with a piece that sounded like no other piece I ever heard. And, um, you know, there's some secrets going on that aren't so secret, like the the low G string is detuned to an E, a low E. So you end up with a tuning that goes from low to top. It's a E, D, A, E, and it almost sounds almost like a guitar. And when you tune a violin, that low string down to an E, you end up actually sort of in between a regular violin tuning and a viola tuning. And so I almost think of the Secret Machine Seven's violin tuning is kind of uncanny violin because it's between violin and viola in its you know range capacity, and um, yeah, I really wanted something that sounded unique and totally new. And working with Miranda Cuxon was sort of the other secret <laughs> to making this work is that she's super amazing. And when she asked for the piece, she said this was in 2021. She's like, "Would you be interested to write me a piece, a solo piece?" And I said, absolutely, um, under the condition I can write whatever I want and take as long as I want. And she pretty much said, oh, bring it on. Uh, and, you know, working with her was was truly an honor of a lifetime. And there's no way the piece would have happened without her input and just relentlessly just being open to me showing up to her apartment with, you know, stacks of music saying, can you read through this really hard stuff that I'm probably not going to use, you know, so I think yeah. we arrived at something that's pretty unique and um, yeah, but it took a lot of work and I got to say, like, I, it, it, I feel like I've written a, a, a decent solo violin piece and I think I, that would be the last one for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of violin, let's look at the, the first uh, two tracks, parts one and parts two of, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this properly. Viola in, is that right? Uh, Violain. Violain. Okay, that's what I originally came up with. Then yes. I was reading some of the program notes about it originally being titled Vi Viola and Violin. Right. Like that. Can you elucidate that for us? Yeah, so originally the title of Violain, the original title was very boring, Violin and Viola. You know, so Violin and Viola um, in the file name, in the, the computer file when I was engraving the piece. And uh, I had a typo, you know, I, I and it ended up saying violin, which is sort of this mashing the two words together. And I didn't even notice that at the time. And then when I went back to work on it, I said, oh, it, this piece is called violin, I guess. And it, it just I just thought it was a really fun. It was a fun typo. And also the piece violin embraces sort of this typo aesthetic in that one while I was writing it, which I write everything by hand. Um, and when you transfer handwritten notation into a computer software program, you're bound to make mistakes. So um, some of those mistakes I made when I heard them in performance, I said, oh, actually, that's more interesting than what I intended. Mm -hmm. And also with the performers, when we were doing different workshops, they would do something that was completely unexpected or, you know, quote unquote, a mistake. And I said, what, what is that? That's actually really interesting. 
And I started to see this sort of typo aesthetic or this mistake language is almost a, a way to generate uh, material or generate a kind of form around that. And um, there's something also very poetic about embracing mistakes, <laughs> you know, and I'm not the first musician to think this is a, a good idea. You know, I think there's some really good Keith Jarrett, uh, you know, quotes about him talking about, you know, how, how he thinks of mistakes. And I don't know, just this idea of incorporating or embracing the, the mistake as sort of a blessing uh, as something you couldn't have come up with from your own internal, you know, in, inside your mind, but externally, the mistake is almost a revelation from God, in a sense. So you can have a, a pitch pipe violin uh, <laughs> suite. <right? laughs> well, okay. Yeah, well, I should mention I have, you know, another, vi I have a violin duo that just was released last month. Um, and the piece is for two violins, and they both have pitch pipes, and it's a 35-minute uh, violin duo called a uh, Dead Horse Bay Thoughts from the Future. And so that one is very much a pitch pipe concerto. And, um, you know, so I, I have to be careful with these pitch pipes because, uh, you know, it's now becoming my calling card. And, you know, my favorite pitch pipe manufacturer actually ran out of stock. And I don't know if it's from me, you know, or ordering these and ruining them. And, you know, so... Yeah, so yeah. I have a lot of pitch pipes here. My performers do too. They're not the most sturdy instruments. I, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I sang in a boys' choir, and we always use pitch pipes, so that's why I'm oh, okay. on that right now. Yeah, well, I, I should. Yeah, I'll write a piece for the boys' choir and pitch pipes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you talked a little bit about the the title track between breath. I, I wonder if you can tell us more about that. And specifically, what does the title mean for you? I mean, it's the name of the entire album. Um, well, the title came from, well, one, you know, between breath, the piece was, it was very much written in lockdown and I was really trying to make a sonic scream. Like I wanted to somehow depict the sort of internal scream I was feeling. And I think a lot of people were feeling, I wanted to sonorize the scream. And so the piece was very much about finding a way to sort of make this kind of angry scream into music and that then eventually becomes something other than just an angry scream. And the between breath title, I think there was so much emphasis at that time, we're talking 2021, 20, 22, around breathing and people sort of being really aware of breath because there's a respiratory, you know, uh, thing going around where, you know, we're all kind of hyper focused on breathing in a certain way. And on top of that, breathing. Uh, you know, this relation to meditation or uh, breath as being this life force thing. And in the in the sense with the music, it's, you know, the trombone uses breath. And so I, I was thinking about the nature of breath and, you know, the inhale, exhale, sort of yin, yang, plus, minus, you know, uh, aspect to it, that binary aspect. But I, but I wondered, what is the sort of liminal space that's in between the breathing? You know, the, the moment where you breathe out and you hold it or breathe in. And like, what is that? You know, the sort of third thing we don't, you know, you're either holding your breath or I guess, you know, blowing it out. But, but I thought of this idea of this liminal space. It's an imaginary idea. I don't think it's actually necessarily real, but this liminal space that's in between breath. And I just thought the between breath was a great title. I like the the double B sound and it, yeah, it just stuck. And I wanted to use that for the title track or the name of the album. I love that in your program book, you have uh, your parts of your score in yes. there, right? Yes. And it's, it's really interesting to see that. I wonder who are your composition heroes? Because it makes me think of other contemporary composers. Oh, interesting. Um, well, uh, yes, that's a great question. My composition heroes, um, well, I'm very old fashioned. And I think like Ravel and Beethoven and Bach and Debussy uh, are sort of my like great, great grandfather heroes of who I really always come back to is, you know, if I was on a desert island, I mean, I'd take Bach with me and that I would be fine. But in terms of contemporary composers, you know, I'm always been a big fan of like Alex Minchek um, and Eric Wubbles, and they've actually run a new music collective uh, called Wet Ink. And Eric Wubbles happens to have a trombone and piano piece that is a truly remarkable, you know, like amazing piece of music. And I think in some way, when I heard 
the trombone and piano, by the way, and I'm sorry for all the trombonists listening to this, but trombone and piano is sort of a lethally not good combination, in my opinion. It just sounds kind of, you know, corny when they're when they're together and kind of cheesy. And it's really hard to find trombone and piano music that I can actually stomach. So, uh, but Eric has this piece that's just so cool. And um, I was like, well, if I'm going to write for trombone and piano, I think Eric... Eric Wubbles would have to be the model because he's written literally one of the coolest pieces of music and it happens to be with trombone and piano. So, I mean, those, you know, sort of the immediate heroes. And then I think you could also draw my uh, musical background back to New York school composers like uh, John Cage and Morton Feldman. Um, and in some way, like Eric Satie is sort of a hero of mine too. I think the sort of enigma of Satie and the simplicity has really held up over time. And I think the older I get with composition, the more I'm really trying to make the most basic thing I can. And so Sati more and more is becoming a hero. He's always been a hero, but it's it's even stronger than maybe it has been before. It's interesting that you say that because I can sense some similarities between what you're doing with music and what Eric Sati did with music in the language of his time, right? Yes. So I can I can hear that definitely. Scott Walschlager is the composer of all the music here on this album, Between Breath. It's out from New Focus Recordings. Um, do you have anything else that you want to say to our listeners as they prepare to dive into this uh, album? Well, you know, this is something I would say if it was a concert, um, if my my work is that, you know, to let yourself get lost, that's okay. Um, and to be wander let your ears wander through the music and i think it's completely acceptable if you space out for a second and come back uh i you know i think my music i want to be very inviting with it and um i would just hope anyone hearing it just <laughs> listens with an open mind and uh you know enjoys the ride because this album is definitely a ride well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And checking in with you again. It's been a while since we talked last time, but uh, I love your music. And uh, this album is certainly no exception. Thank you awesome. very much. Thank you.